Was 2021 just 2020 wearing a mustache? Did we get anything good in pop culture? Was there enough to cling on to, to escape from what was the reality of what we all experienced? Well, the boys are coming together for part one and part two of what we found to be the best content over the last couple, uh, over the last 12 months to be exact. We're talking best of 2021. <sighs> Bobaholics, my name is Christian. I'm the host of this thing, this thing that we've now done for ending our third season. What an exciting ride that it's been. Um, but I'm joined, as always, by my two favorite bestest of friends. Chris Conkling. And Brian Dupree. And what brings us together, as I had mentioned in our little intro, uh, you know, we are talking about... 2021 as we look on to 2022 we're a little bit late so thanks for being patient but we got a lot of really great things to to discuss kind of the format uh, as we're going to talk a little bit about the year in retrospective um and then we're going to go into uh top video games i'm going to bring you that brian's going to bring us our top three albums chris is going to bring us his top three podcast slash youtube channels uh, talk talkies not quite talkies talkies is next episode uh, and then we're all going to discuss individually our favorite top three tv shows uh, so that's going to be this episode next episode we're dedicating entirely to our our individual top f five films of 2021 so a lot of our best of is yet to come Hey, fellow Popaholics, Chris from the future here editing the video. Just a quick note for you guys, because of the length of this session, we actually had to break it up into three separate best of episodes. So the episode that you're currently watching is going to be Christian's best video games of the year, Brian's best albums of the year, and then of course my best podcasts of the year. Episode two is actually going to be our best TV shows of the year, and then episode three will be of course our best films of the year. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of the episode. And as always on this show, how do we do things, gentlemen? Brian, I'm going to let you say it. We do things a bit differently around here. We do things a bit differently. <laughs> we, are, we are bringing this to a close the new year. Chris and I are putting our, our proverbial foot down. It here. will be dead. <laughs> hmm. We're... And we'll that see. is because, you know, 2021 brought a lot of things in pop culture, but also a lot of things in, you know, our personal lives. Me in particular, you know, just to give you some highlights, my 2021 got engaged and then find, found out that I'm going to be a father now here in a, a couple of short months, which may mean that I may be a little more absent from the podcast for the first half of this year. Uh, we'll see more to come on that. Uh, but uh, gentlemen, any, any noteworthy things in your personal life you want to talk about? I know we don't get too personal here. On the show. It's true. Uh, I've mentioned it before. My wife and I bought a house and we moved. Um, that, so that was a huge feat for, for the two of us. I would say that's probably the most prominent thing that's happened to me uh, over the last year. Brian, what about you? So um, in my in my professional career, I just actually at the end of the year got a certification that I'd been studying for for uh, about three or four months. So I was definitely happy about that. And this was kind of the year of consuming new release movies for me. I uh, will definitely talk about it in the next episode more more thoroughly, but I made it a point to try and see two new movies every week this year. Um, so a minimum of 104. As of recording, I got to, and I finished these on the first and the second. So I was at 128 by the end of the year, and I am now at 132 new release movies that I saw this year. So uh, <laughs> I'm Brian. the single, I'm the single one of us here, and movies were my partner this this 2021. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I just have to say that so few people are able to set New Year's resolutions for themselves and not only follow through, but excel at them. And I could not be more proud of you for the I don't know. Sheer I don't know if it's something to be proud volume of. of cinema that you were able to consume this year. It is an inspiration to me. And I hope that uh, with you and I, what we're gonna be doing over the first couple months, uh, I'm able to see more new releases this year uh, with you, especially considering that there's a theater like five minutes from me, from my new house. So uh, pandemic. <laughs> Or, or not, we'll see what happens. But uh, I'm super proud of you, dude. That's a huge feat. No, th I mean, I had a really good time with it. And after 2020, where there were really weren't that many releases because of the state of the world and the pandemic, 
there was really so just a wealth of incredible movies. Like I have easily 30 plus movies that I would recommend that I really enjoyed this year, you know, probably more than that. But um, yeah, so the, the top of the top. you a solid recommend for 2021 film, tweet at True Popaholic. He'll, I've, he'll, I've got, he'll tell you what's I've up. I've got a handful for sure. You got to come but, um, with some yeah. sort of Mad Lib so that like there's like a thing they just fell out and they're like, okay, I'm going to recommend uh, <laughs> Memoria. <laughs> oh, Memoria was the late stage top 10 uh, computer, I must say, but <sighs> hardly anyone can see that. It's literally doing... We're way off topic here. I was lucky enough to see it in its first week run where it's only running for a week at a time at individual screens, apparently forever. It's like a forever release or something. I've never heard of this before, but it's going to be very difficult to see for a while unless you buy it straight from uh, Neon, I think. Yes, in more movies to come next episode, but we got a lot to get into uh, this one. But before we do that, uh, let's let's think about what uh, pop culture looked like this year. Uh, I'll I'll go first and talk about it, uh, and we'll dive more into the movie landscape on our on our our movie uh, focused one. But I got to say, this was the year of even across movies uh, delays and postponements, and the year of uh, the year of the stream and potentially the Fortniteification of everything around us. Uh, we we had a lot of a lot of stuff pushed to streaming. HBO Max had made that thing real like real early about putting everything on streaming. Um, when it came to music, they had pushed off so many albums because, you know, the way that modern music works is they, they basically put out singles and EPs. And then when big artists want to go on tour, they put the album out and then announce their tour. And there was so much of these pushbacks that occurred. And then also in the world of gaming, we had so many delays. So the delays continued, but some of them just boiled over and and we got a lot of stuff released. How did you guys feel the overall, uh, you know, landscape was on, on media and, and entertainment? I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of what what this year is representative of. A delays is definitely the key word for 2021. But even more so if we're diving into the uh, type of content that we saw in the year 2021. It was really interesting to see kind of the first six months, the type of art that people were releasing. And as we predicted at the end of 2020, the three of us said that this was going to be the year of pandemic art you know, where uh, artists were kind of mulling over their experiences over the course of 2020 and then finally releasing these projects for the world to see. So we had like the first six months of the year being really representative of what had happened in 2020, the year prior. The second half of this year, the latter half, uh, we have seen, I I think, fewer and fewer projects like that. But the Fortniteification, as you put it, Christian, is something that I'm very interested to talk about, and we'll dive more into that uh, when we talk about films in part two of our best of this year. But uh, uh, <laughs> the cinema landscape is very interesting right now. Let's just say that. But even and in, in TV terms shows, of- uh, I just want to mention too, as you're on the subject of post-pandemic, like all the TV <laughs> shows we were. My, my fiance is watching Law and Order, and they're like wearing masks, so all these like TV shows and, and, and stuff had to like ask themselves, are we going to live in the universe of where COVID-19 is a thing? And so you yeah. see the, the episodes that are the, the, the t- properties that pivoted to that, the ones that are like, you know, daytime TV, they like leaned into it. And then other stuff is just like, for instance, the Marvel cinematic universe was just like the blip was the pandemic. I don't know. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. I mean, the Marvel cinematic universe right now is taking place in the year like 2024 so technically it would be like far out from the pandemic but uh i mean shows like the morning show did not shy away from utilizing covid as a narrative point i don't know if you guys have seen season 15 of always sunny in philadelphia but oh my god the way they've utilized all the crazy things that happened in 2020 it might be one of my favorite pieces of pandemic art that's come out because it's so absurd wow. and so hilarious in the first they basically <laughs> historical fictionize the sunny gang into some of the most major events of 2020 uh, if you haven't i don't want to go into details because it is so hilarious but if you haven't seen the most recent season of always sunny in philadelphia i highly highly recommend just watching the first episode the whole season's been great but definitely that first episode uh is very good here's a teaser they give you the backstory behind rudy giuliani's uh hair dye yep mm-hmm. fiasco yep 
Oh, and, the, and some of the outfits that we saw at the insurrection. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's great stuff. <laughs> oh, it's pretty it's great. great stuff. Brian, looking back on 2021, what comes to mind? Honestly, one of the things that really stood out for me this year as someone who really likes live music and maybe in the last few years hadn't been hadn't been seeing as much as I would have liked. It's something that I really started missing. And a lot of artists started doing either um, donation based or free live streams for um, different causes that get a bunch of artists together doing in their home recordings kind of stripped down a bit. But it really felt like this nice community building that is so great with seeing live music and it kind of sustained itself to some degree obviously artists were not making nearly the money they would have otherwise been touring like you you touched on a bit and a lot of tours had to be postponed but it was really nice to see people still not only creating and releasing music but finding new ways to perform that i think is going to become more of the norm as we go forward i know last year travis scott you guys talked about a fortnight thing he did a fortnight event um, slash concert that really was kind of mind blowingly good and kind of showed the future for this stuff. And this year we got something from uh, Tom York and Stanley Donwood, this Radiohead um, Kid A Amnesia um, virtual virtual experience, basically like a virtual museum that I think similarly was a template setting. Um, kind of platform to show where the future of these sorts of online experiences can and will inevitably go. So um, on top of theaters and everything, this kind of brought forth a lot of things that were already coming down the pipeline. Definitely um, it sped them up in, in some sense and forced people to acknowledge that in some sense, this is the new reality and have adapted accordingly. Yeah, and I think that leads into something that was announced that I think is going to have ramifications and not necessarily, hopefully, God forbid, this company specifically, uh, but Facebook rebranded to Meta, which is which is talking about the metaverse and bringing the metaverse. And there's a certain angle that they're trying to approach it from being kind of the main h hardware and underlying OS tech that underlies that. But I think it's like your, the Oasis. Uh, yeah, like the Oasis or like the metaverse uh, from what Snowpiercer is it? Um, I believe as uh, when it was actually coined, right? Uh, as we, as so much in the world felt dystopian, getting the glimpses of how media, at least in pop culture, is going to change. And and like you said, and, and full disclosure, which I'm gonna have to do this a couple times in this episode. Uh, I work for Apple, but I do not work for their TV division, which we will mention. I do not work for Apple Music or anything. Uh, Apple Music did like live events that that just played in in mm -hmm. app, right? And, and it was this interactive thing of, oh, this is a music streaming thing, but there's this video element. Kid A put out a, a, basically a video game. It's like an interactive museum. So I think we're already starting to see these beginnings of kind of all this content blurring together. And that's where I talk about the Fortniteification of things because they kind of established this multi-IP thing. And I think we're going to see not only that with IPs, but individual creators and stuff bleeding over into each other more than we've ever seen and more of these interactive elements being well it's not really an album it's an nft which is also a suit you can wear in Fortnite, which is also uh, Brian <laughs> knows a little i don't bit think about nfts i don't think there's any giant pop cultural movies or anything that indicate this at all christian you're totally <laughs> off, off base here. we got the matrix <laughs> unreal engine 5 and we've seen unreal engine which is a video game engine enter in uh like lucas studios uses it for for a lot of their stuff for the mandalorian that that's a live rent that they call it the box or the walnut or something the volume um, the uh yeah the walnut's the smaller one and then they got the volume but the you could, live uh engine we're gonna get the avatar sequels here pretty soon i think the first one is slated for 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 this year now let's, this, let's not make yeah. any crazy uh predictions here about that you know we got sequels. that that matrix demo which was like yeah this is unreal 5 and these are assets from the movie that we actually put in the game and they're interchangeable like this feels like an inevitability of all these these kind of art things and as we develop our show and we have our top individual things i think as the years go on it's going to be harder to differentiate <laughs> the, the between type the of different kind. categories but you yeah. know what and there there were some i mean there was one project in particular this year that for 12 months we've been talking about what category does this particular project go in you know we'll get to that next week or uh, in the next episode but yeah so it's just the beginning it's, it's only the beginning 
so, you know, but we can still categorize them and we have some rough categories here. But even once we get into TV shows, I have one that's like, I don't know, it's a documentary, but it's also a TV show. I don't know. So it, it, some of the lines are a little bit blurry. Uh, but for this, uh, we're going to start things off and uh, I'm actually going to have Brian start and bring us the top three albums of the year as selected by Brian or our, our official music curator. So why don't you dive into it? What you got oh, at number <laughs> She got it number three. I, don't, I wouldn't call myself an official music curator, but this year I did also listen to a ton of albums, a lot of which was What was just, the number, Brian? You uh, texted it to us the other day. Yeah, it's 335 new releases, albums and EPs, um, so of various length. But a lot of this uh, is like instrumental stuff and ambient uh, jazz sort of things that I listen to while I'm working. So a lot of it is passive listening. Um, but yeah, in terms of the albums that I really loved and found myself coming back to, uh, number three has got to be Halsey's latest album, If I Can't Have Love, I Want Power. So I actually found out about this from my good friend Peter and shameless other self-promo here. We will be covering this. Um, I think the week this comes out, our next ad- episode of Adaptations, we are covering uh, the movie and the album that is associated with this. So Halsey wrote a movie that came out with this that was a limited release in, um, I don't know if it was one of those. So this uh, first choice does obscure, obscure the it already, Yes, we're already blending. The genres. <laughs> yes. So my, my first experience with this album was um, watching the movie, which doesn't have every single song and the order is different. But I'm a huge fan of narrative concept albums, of which this is one. And it's uh, an exploration of motherhood and how women are perceived in society. Halsey had or was having her child throughout the course of this and appears, I believe, actually pregnant in the movie itself. So a lot of like personal stuff that she's working through here. And there's also things about the idea of the Madonna versus the whore and the duality of of these sorts of things. And it just has some really beautiful genre bending pop music on it. It is produced and co-written by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross uh, of Nine Inch Nails, as well as Jonathan Cunningham, Greg Kirsten and Halsey um, herself. And it's just an incredible pop album. I think it I, I'm not good with defining genres, but this goes from electronic influences to grunge influences. Um, Christian, you may be able to speak to this a little more than me, but it goes all over the place. And Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross are clearly heard here, but then you have some really awesome lyricism and Halsey playing around with dealing with being famous and the distrust of people and relationships that come with that sort of lifestyle and grappling with the deep love and affection she has for her newborn child and reflecting on what life means and the new implications of life um, when you love someone so deeply, right? So um, I'll just say a couple of favorite tracks, um, Bells in Santa Fe, Darling in 1121 is probably my favorite pairing of two tracks on the album. And the last track, Ya Bernay which I apologize about pronunciation, but there's a lot of really um, beautiful stuff here. And then a couple of just fun, danceable bangers where she's kind of relishing in um, the fun of life and the debauchery to some level. Um, So yeah, I had a lot of fun with this album and the fact that it was co-released with a movie was just very much up my alley in terms of um, creative stuff that I was into. No, that's really cool. I got to uh, check out, you had put this on the list, I checked out the first few tracks of it, and the thing that struck me, again, was that not really definable by genre. I think we've seen some of these artists, such as Billie Eilish, or even Taylor Swift over the course of her entire career, of really bending these genres, but this is really a microcosm of of different styles and takes. I found it really bold for for someone who is known mostly uh, for her feature on Closer by the Chainsmokers, Chainsmokers. Uh, to have such a, an intensely deep and personal record and uh, really the confidence of it right from the get-go we get uh, the tradition and bells in Santa Fe which are pretty sparsely instrumental tracks that really focus on the singer and they carry their own weight uh, it's uh, for me it's always a bold choice of how good you think a song is written as someone who's written a few songs myself um, when you strip it down now there's a lot of stuff going on underneath a lot of uh, ambiance and a lot of uh, saturation in the sound but it is really crazy and 
they almost feel like Adele songs at the end of the day that are have mm. like kind of this darker kind of thematic and uh, melodramatic twist to them. And then going into Easier Than Lying, it's just a straight up grunge rock song. It, it has the same cadence uh, as the Foo Fighters. <laughs> like it sounds like a like oh, a yeah. Trent Reznor's Foo Fighters song. And so uh, really cool genre mix up. Uh, if, there, if I have one critique, it's just the vocal uh, stylings and stuff is a little all over the place as far as how the vocals sit and are balanced in the mix but is to be expected when you're experimenting with this many genres and definitely not a huge knock against it Uh, not what what i was expecting from this artist so definitely a great recommend brian i'm glad you put it on there yeah so that was my number three uh halsey's if i can't have love i want power so my number two was a project that i found in the first half of the year Uh, for better and for worse i've started following and Uh, watching from afar the DIY Twitter space, which (laughs) is very interesting. It's uh, a cool community that will turn on people in a flash. And often you have to like go through mountains of retweets and subtweets to understand who did what. And a lot of times there's um, atrocious stuff there. Sometimes it's maybe something that is much more debatable, but this community has introduced me to a lot of artists that I never would have heard of. Um, Christian, I think you may have been one of the starts here because Barty Strange, who's an artist that you pointed us to earlier in the year, who also put out a great album. I think it's called Live Forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Produced this record for Harmony Woods, which is called Graceful Rage. So um, this is a Philly-based band and Sophia Verbila, I apologize about pronunciation, is the, the lead singer and songwriter. And Rittenhouse, the second track on this album, was a song that I was obsessed with for a period of time this year. And it was one of these songs that I was immediately gripped by purely the sound and the music. I wasn't necessarily paying attention to the vocals as much, uh, aside from the melodies that, that she was singing. And I was just really hooked by it. And it was probably, it seems ridiculous, but um, it was probably close to 50 or 100 times that I had heard this song that I, it actually clicked for me what the song was literally about. And it's kind of obvious. It's right there on the page in the lyrics. But it just broke me emotionally, um, having heard this song over and over, getting so captivated and caught up in the emotion without even knowing what she was saying yet. And then it kind of hitting me. And it was like a ton of bricks. Um, and it's really stuck with me. And it's one of my favorite tracks of the year. I think this album is top to bottom, really solid. That's that's probably my favorite track. Um, the, the first track is called Good Luck Road and it's definitely another favorite. Um, the whole album is very much trying to um, grapple with and acknowledge previous uh, relationship issues. Good Luck Road is about basically being gaslit and being done with it. And the rest of the album is kind of Um, playing with similar territory of trying to get over this bad relationship and these traumatic things that you've had to deal with. Um, There's a really fun track that almost feels a little bit like Blink-182 at times called God's Gift to Women. It's kind of this takedown of someone who thinks they deserve everything, but they're just uh, a piece of shit, basically. And Graceful Rage, the title track is great, but it ends on I Can't, which is basically a song where she's lamenting that she can't forgive this this former lover lover and it's very much an emo indie rock album um and i have kind of uh become a a loyal follower of harmony woods because of this project um Christian, you said you had gotten a chance to listen to this one as well, right? Yeah, I listened to it earlier in the year, and it, it struck me as the first thing I thought of with, with the listen through was just really confident, uh, really well organized songwriting. Uh, it's comp- uh, composed beautifully. Uh, it's typically not my specific niche of this genre, and, and you mentioned the DIY scene. A lot of these people are based out of Philly. Um, we, I mentioned Origami Angel on our, I believe, our last best of um, one of the <laughs> one of the. Uh, bands out of there and that is a very big influence in the diy scene and you know it is one of those scenes that's very they're very uh lgbtq friendly and very very not for any type of uh male dominated gaslighting and uh like very subversive kind of alpha male if you want to call it that mentalities and also not putting up with any accusations of uh wrongdoing when it comes to people abusing their power so all those things are great it's always a balancing game and i think that's what they struggle with is uh you know everything seems to light a fire in that community (laughs) uh but bless them there i I, there's a lot lot to love about the community i think harmony woods is is a great representative force of that 
uh, you know, being a female singer songwriter, really love what Barty Strange. I'm a huge fan. Live Forever is one of my favorite records uh, from last year, and and that that is pr- is probably my number one. And I love what he brings to the table, which she brings a lot of like grit and edge and added accoutrements. It sounds like uh, that give it uh, more Barty Strange sound. So that combination makes it a real winner for me. So I think this is also a great choice. Yeah, so that's Graceful Rage by Harmony Woods, and then number one, I was just referring to it here. Um, I actually got got the vinyls for all three of my my top picks this year, but had Very to put nice. up number one, which is Mood Ring by Kississippi. So this is led by uh, singer so- songwriter Zoe Alaire Reynolds, and as you can see from the cover here, it is pretty definitionally bubblegum pop music. Uh, very listenable, super catchy, uh, saccharine in the best ways, and is kind of on its whole a synth pop album. And this sort of stuff, um, I know it's very different, but something like the Cocktoo Twins, um, I'm very into this sort of, this isn't as experimental as something like Cocktoo Twins, but these very ambient and kind of ethereal sounding sort of albums this one plays a lot with that, but it also has stripped down tracks that you could see on a Taylor Swift album or easily compare it to something like that. The whole album is basically either unrequited or not longing and beautiful kind of wanting to be in a relationship, wanting to figure out your partner, just really uh, vying for affection and love. My favorite song, which immediately hopped up to one of the most listened to songs on my phone ever is called dreams with you, which is this, this really sweet, uh, it may be simple to some, but it hits the exact, uh, exact escapism that I needed this year. Uh, The hook is falling back asleep so I can be in dreams with you. And it's just this beautiful idea of longing from afar and hoping that, you know, you can find someone in the future and have a, uh, I don't know, a a happy relationship. Obviously, uh, if you listen to these albums, you can see I was maybe uh, going through something this year in terms of uh, where my mental state was. But um, I genuinely think this is an incredible album from top to bottom and has immediately become something that I just put on and can listen to um, anytime, pretty much. And it'll it'll perk my mood up and, and obviously get me in my emotional feels as well. Uh, Brian, this is such an excellent choice for number one because it's the kind of music that I think a lot of people need right now. Uh, coming, this from, is it, right? <laughs> coming like, yes. from the background, if if any of our listeners have listened to my music at Midnight Satire, I imagine wasn't on the favorite records oh, list because my record officially didn't come out this year. Um, that's the only reason I'm finding this acceptable, Brian. Uh, but <laughs> 2022. You know, I gotta say, uh, this the music from Kasepi, uh I'm so jealous of because there's this clear headed attention to detail. And there's nothing excessive about it. Everything you need for the songs to work is in the song. And it's very clean. It's kind of got this washed out or like synth wave uh, 80s yes. vibe to it. But it's such yeah. a light and graceful touch. And the the pop hooks, are, I mean, it's a, you can put on any of these songs and they're immediately likable. And that is such a hard thing to do. And some people write that off as rote or as uh, playing too much. But the listenable quality that this has and the strength of the melodies uh, involved in the, the meter that's uh, dis- on display is, is, is quite something to be uh, very respected. And it takes a very good songwriter to know exactly what you need to make these kind of uh, things. I think all of them are, are hits. I can't believe I hadn't heard of this artist before you put it on there. Uh, I'm a big fan. Um, right off the jump, um, I think it rivals anything Taylor Swift has done the last couple of years, um, which is saying a lot. She's Whoa, one of the biggest crazy. pop. Well, noticed, uh, I don't see any Taylor Swift records on here on the list. Um, and Taylor Swift's a, a talent, right? And working with a lot of talented people. Uh, this was put out by Triple Crown, which typically has. Uh, it's an indie label that has a lot of up-and-comers. So I'm uh, really proud of this team. Uh, obviously, a really great songwriting team, really great production team. Uh, they're all hits. Uh, I, I would just list all of them. They're all very fun. But In Tune is just, I don't know, it's a perfect pop song. It's amazing. <laughs> Uh, yep. And there's, I think my, I think my favorite song off my, uh, I just had one straight listen through, which was so, again, couldn't be easier to just, just put it on and and and, and vibe to it. Um, will have to be Hellbang, which is the closer. It's got this mm-hmm. contemporary Christian rock vibe that you know I'm still a sucker for. It's very, again, very straightforward. Nothing that's going to challenge your expectations of what's going to come after the next note, but all very satisfying. And uh, yeah, 
I'm as Brian likes to say, I'm I'm totally here for it. And I immediately <laughs> sent it to my fiance and said, "You're gonna really like this because she's a big Taylor Swift. She loves oh, all this good. Cool and pop stuff." So, uh, yeah, great, great uh, number one pick, Brian. Very well, well put. Thank you. And that's going to do it for albums. That's our top albums. And uh, we hope that you check those out. Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you check out any of this stuff, a uh, great call. It. So again, just to go through again, we have um, If I Can't Have Love, I Want Power by Halsey, Graceful Rage by Harmony Woods, and Mood Ring by Kasipi. All right, moving into my section that we didn't debate about how we were going to break this up. And I'm so glad that I've got the opportunity to bring us the Popaholics Best Video Games of 2021. Uh, how so, many before you start christian how many video games did you play this year oh that's what we're doing right we're breaking down i, I really so f that came out this year i'd probably say over 30 easy um i didn't actually count wow. them but when i went through um some favorite games uh, i'd played most of the ones i wanted to get to a couple that i just didn't have the opportunity to play would be something like it takes two because you need two players and i actually only have one controller for my console right now and um i didn't convince any of you to buy this or do anything but i've heard this great it's co-op game that apparently is really lovely it has to do with like divorce and there's lots of mini games in it and i, I hear that's lovely and i also want to play metroid dread which i do have a switch light it's my fiance's but actually the story behind why i didn't play metroid dread and it won't be featured here um because i've heard nothing but great things and i love classic nintendo uh, making really really great software uh is that uh i'm actually planning on playing it while i'm waiting for my wife to deliver or excuse me my fiance at this point uh to deliver our child so it's my it's gonna be my hospital game to play which is metroid right. dread which is very gonna, nice gonna be interesting uh dichotomy there but yeah so those are a couple ones that i wanted to get to but didn't have the chance um, but let's go through this. Uh, the top three games from what I played. Um, I'm not a PC gamer, just as a disclosure. I do not have. I do have a, a a boot on my Mac for playing some Windows VR stuff, but I don't have a really heavy rig. So most of these were played on either an Xbox Series S or um, a PlayStation Five, uh, which I've had all year. Lucky enough to have a PlayStation Five. Uh, so the first one that I definitely played on PlayStation Five is Deathloop. Um, this is developed by Arcane Studios and published by Bethesda, and it was a, it's a limited um, it's a limited PlayStation Five exclusive, but I do. Believe believe it's coming to pc um if it hasn't already very soon this year um yeah it, i think it's already out on on windows and this is a first person shooter it's made by the same people that make the dishonored series which is another like first person action very light rpg but very tactical thing so a lot of like giving you scenarios and having you figure it out and I've always thought the Dishonored series was really cool in concept, and I never really vibed with it. And really, Deathloop was the secret sauce for me. I'd said early on in the year when we talked about Deathloop that it definitely was going to crack my top games and was vying for number one early on in the year, um, which I believe at this point it was September, so not too early. But uh, really, really, really engaging stuff. Uh, basically, the gist of the game is that you're stuck in a loop, similarly like Groundhog Day. And in this day, there's like this anarchist island uh, of crazy people and scientists and all these people uh, and uh, you have to kill uh, all these leaders or like influencers quote unquote in order to close the loop and there's a greater story that involves you and another individual who can jump into your game at any point and disrupt your loop and that other individual can be played by another player so just a lot of really cool mechanics and figuring it out I do recommend um, because I kind of played it this way on accident uh, when you go through you finding clues to try to figure out how to play the perfect round where you can take out all these individuals in one single day and i played it like this unknowingly but i didn't really follow the markers i just kind of read the clues and let it guide me now there is a waypoint system that kind of just as you just go to next waypoint you'll get all the story stuff and it just tells you where to go next i didn't play it a lot of that so i really enjoyed having to read through understand the characters and uh, find out what to do next which is a totally viable way to play it it makes it harder and will make the game longer but i think it immerses you in the world really want to shout out the the writing on this for a game that's doing what i said a lot of what red dead did which is seemingly emergent gameplay as like i'm discovering stuff things are popping up and happening and although this is heavily scripted because it has this wide open format you're going to experience it in maybe it's slightly different order and just the cast of characters these influencer people that you're trying to take out all have their own personalities their dynamics with the other characters their history with you and the back and forth between you and kind of the protagonist character that comes in and out of your game um, is really really charming uh, so it has these really fun gameplay mechanics you're able to get powers 
and get guns and do various upgrades uh, by taking out certain influencers and getting their powers. And just that mix of gameplay and the kind of sandbox nature of the way the levels work uh, really led itself to being very replayable. Add in the multiplayer aspect that adds a little bit of variety and a little bit of uh, competitive nature to a single player experience. And it's just a really unique, fun ride. And I had a lot of fun with it. Um, it's it's a little violent, a little kind of cynical, but uh, definitely uh, takes the cake for a lot of those things. So that is Deathloop, available on PS5. That is my number three. My number two, gentlemen, has to be the biggest surprise. Uh, movies... Fl I'm flabbergasted. I can't were, believe it. Was there a point where you said you were debating not playing this game? There was. Do I remember this correctly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we had gotten Marvel's The Avengers, which I, again, for all that's wrong with it and wrong with me, apparently, I enjoy the Marvel's Avengers game. It is a bad game. Uh, that I has had an incredibly toxic relationship yeah. with Marvel's The Avengers. It's Stockholm Syndrome at this point with, with Marvel's The Avengers. <laughs> it really Can't is. Stop. But as soon as any new content comes out, I'm on top of it. I level up every new character, whatever. But I will say that like that experience kind of burned me to the idea of what they were doing, what Square Enix was doing with... Um, our, our, our heroes in the Marvel Universe. We've seen great success from things like Insomniac Spider-Man um, and, uh, you know, uh, it looks like that, that game that actually just got delayed, but the uh, Midnight Suns uh, made by the people that made um, XCOM looks really awesome. So they're doing a lot of cool stuff in the superhero escape, but Square Enix doesn't seem to be delivering the top tier. So when I heard this was going to be Square Enix, it was in third person. It was very similar looking to Avengers. I mean, I didn't have high hopes and I was like, is this just the Avengers DLC that they decided to spin off into its own game? And I'm happy to report that whether it's a mix of my expectations being just so low in the dirt, um, this is my number two game of the year. And although the gameplay is pretty fun, and once you understand it and get into it, I think that it's really rewarding and really interesting because essentially Star-Lord himself isn't that powerful. Your character isn't, but all your sidekicks are. And it's about learning and upgrading their powers and using them as a team and coming together. And there's lots of cool mechanics. There's a huddle up feature uh, that you can come together and you have to pick the right inspirational phrase based on what they've told you. And that kind of can happen emergently throughout fights. But really what, what roots this down is it is one of the best looking games um, I've ever seen. And the story is insanely good. So it's a really awesome Guardians of the Galaxy story. It's probably my favorite even out of uh, the cinematic universe that we've gotten so far. Uh, as far as paying attention to each character, giving you um, a, a lot of backstory to, 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 to dive into, um, as well as just the overarching story and how it connects with Peter Quill and with all the other characters. It just really is such a surprise. Um, I think that, uh, again, the gameplay aside, which I think is just fine, um, really it's that story and cinematic storytelling that I just didn't get, right? We didn't have A Last of Us this year. We didn't have, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead Redemption. We didn't have one of these tentpole uh, PlayStation cinematic experiences. We didn't have a God of War or anything. So, right. So there was this gap that, uh, I know Chris, you really enjoy too, when it comes to what you can get from video games, having what we call like a cinematic story and really right. guardians of the galaxy was the only thing that delivered that thing for me. And I couldn't stop playing it. It was about 14 to 16 hours or so. It has like a fake ending. And as I mentioned in our episode, it does something cinematically in a story that you just can't do in a movie that lends a very dramatic touch. That is kind of what I come to video games for uh, apart from movies and what you can experience it's it was really a heartbreaking thing I don't want to spoil but a really like character driven involves gameplay and involves you with your controller in your hand going like I don't want to do this and you're going through it with the character and to me that's a magical thing that only thing video uh, only video games can bring um, it's just so insanely special and it's a looker it's a really good looking game I loved collecting all the different outfits and stuff for for all the characters um, everybody's voice acted really really well and although you know Chris Pratt for all his other acting uh, issues and things like that and maybe not being perfect in some roles uh, Chris Pratt is Star-Lord right so it was a big mountain to overcome and it took the game some serious time to overcome this but I think the per person who I don't even know off the top of my head I don't even have pulled up uh, who voices uh, uh, Peter Quill uh, does a good enough job and eventually wins the hearts and minds of anybody who plays it um, this is a surprise hit for me but that's why Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy is number two. Chris, will this at all convince you to play this this game? Or have you just watched the playthrough and you're you're good? I might. I I have watched a playthrough of it, so I, I'm already familiar with the story. Um, but this gap that you're talking about, Christian, and narrative-based video games this year and kind of the lack thereof, 
is one of the reasons why I'm not participating in this category this year. You know, the last two years I've always participated in the video game category. I played three video games this year, and I think two of them were games that came out last year or a decade ago. <laughs> so it just wasn't worth it for me to even give uh, my opinion along with Christians this year. But that being said, 2022, I'm very excited for it because we're going to be getting a lot of really cool games, hopefully, if they're not delayed. Um, so hopefully next year I'll be able to participate here. Yeah. And it, we'll see. We'll see if I get Guardians of the Galaxy. Well, it's been slashed to hell uh, as far as price wise. I paid a premium and it's currently not that much. I think you can get it on sale for PlayStation for like 20 bucks. That's not so bad. It's, it's not a great bad. time wow. to pick yeah. it up. It's a huge recommend if you're into cinematic story games um, and you're OK with kind of the gameplay not being the centerpiece, but still being a lot of fun. When you combine all the Guardians powers together and learn end up doing these combos, it's really satisfying. Um, and it's really well done and it feels really good. And you're like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm managing the guardians of the galaxy. This is great. You know, exactly what you want. Uh, very cool. Uh, Brian, me and you played a lot of rocket league this year and rocket league's always kind of a number one in my heart. That's old reliable. Rocket league forever. Yeah. It's, it's always going to be there and is always as good as it needs to be, which is perfect for what it is. Absolutely. <laughs> That brings me to number one, which uh, is a buzzer beater in in this year's running. And I had to ask wow. myself, is it is this the new new? And that's why I'm doing this. And that's what was hard to put to like, this was a very hard thing to put this list together, especially because it ended up being kind of in order of when I played them. I played Deathloop before I played Marvels and I played Marvels before I played this game. And I really had to wrestle with it. But when I asked myself what I come to video games for and what video games mean to me as a playground of having fun nothing quite does it like halo and that's why halo infinite gets my game of the year which is very surprising to me i played this game by just sheer chance i promise i didn't actually diabolically mean to buy an xbox uh spoiler alert i was able to find a ps5 for my brother and i was gonna get him a series s but then i found a playstation so i kept the series s because there was a new halo and it was just kind of like all right let's roll with it it's on game pass 15 bucks a month to play to play halo it's like worst case scenario i just return it in two weeks and yeah. there's no way i'm returning my xbox now because Halo is just so good and it's so back and Halo itself, I, I'm very biased and I'm going to admit that biases is Halo is one, was one of my favorite games growing up and uh, but it has taken a lot like I have not been addicted to every Halo that's came out since three and uh, that's because I don't think any of them were as good polished or understood what Halo did so well. So Halo Infinite is by 343 Studios, which is the second um publisher to take over from Bungie and they are uh, they've they've really taken a long time to find their stride but really the playability of even just the campaign being a nice little swing on the Halo franchise being this open world uh, that just ha has just enough to do everything you do in it is really fun the guns feel great they feel really well balanced um, the mechanics and physics of everything just make this an insanely fun playground and what boys what was I talking about grappling hook grappling, grappling hook. hook if the grappling if the grappling hook wasn't the game this wouldn't even be on a top three uh, conversation it really wouldn't because the grappling hook just makes the whole game incredible christian i was trying to get in did this game hook you before you got to it but uh oh, I, I, figured to keep, <laughs> I figured to keep your <laughs> your review clean instead of interrupting you but i i knew where you were going it just says everything I mentioned in a review. You can hear much more in depth about it. Uh, but just the idea that you are able to grab weapons. I, yesterday, I was playing a round on multiplayer where uh, they spawn the power weapons and power ups like the overshield and camo are big power ups. Right. And there's a time on the map when the, the announcer says overshield spawning and everybody knows where it's at. So everybody kind of choke points into there. It becomes a, a content, a contents area. Uh, excuse me, an intense, contentious area. And I was sitting off to the side on like a little island and I just grappling hooked the the, the overshield away from a guy that was running up to it, overshielded up and picked my grappling hook back up and dominated him. I've been saving so many clips and although the campaign's great, it's really the most fun I've had in multiplayer. I have the privilege of having a, a bunch of friends that also have an Xbox and are playing Halo. So it's been one of the few games I've been able to play with a lot of friends. Uh, and uh, really enjoy that and it's just a tight arena shooter and I just haven't had anything like that I'm not a huge fan of the Call of Duties 
Um, I don't like that. I just run around a corner and die. And that's not the, the rhythm of Halo. It's really like a combo based thing. Like you have to throw a good grenade and you have to aim good and you have to aim good or, and, and get a melee hit at the right time. Or again, use these items to your advantage. Like there's, you have to do a combination of things to quickly defeat an opponent. It's not always in, in the regular game modes, just about landing headshots. There's this other tactical element, which gamifies it and makes it really fun. And this captures all of those uh, those really brilliantly. I think they have some network things to. I said the network stuff was pretty smooth for me. I have run into like some things, like the big team battle, which is like the sixteen player multiplayer. Like sometimes it just won't load or find a match for me. It's not really my game of choice anyway, so it's not a big deal breaker. But I do know that they have some work to do there. But otherwise, man, yes, this takes the cake for like the most fun that I've had in a game in a while. It brings me back to being a kid. There's some nostalgia at play, Chris. I'll admit that. Okay. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. No, there is. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, but <laughs> but I will say. I, Just give into it. We oh, all have no. to. Outside of all that, man, whew, there ain't nothing like getting a headshot, grappling hook over to pick up an energy sword, killing some of the energy sword. Someone has a grappling hang, ha hammer and then you have a repulsor blast that could push them off the map. The announcer's so good. The like, It's pretty cool. Every way you can kill somebody <laughs> has like the announcer slang to it so if you no scope someone he comes on a classic fashion goes no scope and you're like yeah and then if you if you blow someone off a map with uh with the repulsor it goes mind the gap you know and just so just this like big beefy <laughs> That's arena game that just makes you feel good at everything you're doing uh i mean there's stuff that i didn't even know how to catch phrase right it's like if you if you land every headshot on someone and kill them with a battle rifle he goes perfect he's <laughs> like okay yes of course, like I, I want a video game that just goes full balls to the wall tilt on just giving you that like great arena feeling of being in a game similar to, like Quake and all that. Like, yes, I'm in a video game. Have a dumb announcer come on and be like, spectacular or perfect kill. Yes, come on. More games need that. So, what a what a fun ride. Halo Infinite takes my cake at number one. Go play it if you. The Series S, honestly, takes my number one game. I have, with Game Pass, 15 bucks a month, there's like 100 games. I've been playing like eight different games. Some of them are trash, but guess what? It's the same fee. Like, they cracked the Netflix of games, and it's such a deal. Oh, my God. And it's got Forza and Halo. Halo? Halo. <laughs> it's got Halo on there? <laughs> I love me some Halo. It's just so good. Get you an Xbox Series S. It's such a good deal. 300 bucks, $15 a month subscription. Like, come gaming pc for two grand finding a graphics card paying five grand for a graphics fuck out of here there's a cheaper way to game i love that this opens up gaming to so many more people and it's so accessible so my top three picks for video games of the year number three death loop number two marvel's guardians of the galaxy and number one halo infinite halo infinite steaktacular is that a real one? Is that a, is that a Matrix it, reference? No, Steaktacular. I don't actually know how to get a Steaktacular. I think a Steaktacular is when you when your team kills every member of their team at the same time. If I'm not mistaken, uh, I know I randomly get it, and I'm pretty sure that's the that's the combo. Uh, but yeah, very exciting. I'll send you all those audio uh, audio stuff. Please do. Yeah, I will. So that's going to do it for top video games of the year, and that leads us to our final thing before TV shows before we all chip in, and that's going to be Chris. Uh, something we don't like doing on our podcast, uh, but we make some room for it because it we value it as an art form and think it should have awards, being that that is the art that we create, which is a podcast, top podcast, also findable on YouTube, I think, is your interesting... Uh, yeah, the reason the reason I've chosen to do a podcast slash uh, top three podcasts slash YouTube this year is because most podcasts like ours also are now available in video formats on YouTube. So you'll find that a lot of creators and artists are doing the uh, the the double format thing with a uh, video and audio. Podtacular. So some of these I found via YouTube, and they also have you know audio versions available on all your favorite podcast players and then some of them i found via uh just just podcast players you know so that's why i'm including both very good so give it to us what are your top <laughs> three podcast slash youtube channels of 2021 so, i just want to say 
Go figure, someone who co-hosts a pop culture podcast enjoys listening to pop culture podcasts while he's working and driving and doing things where you're not able to actually watch something, but you can listen to something. So you're going to find a through line with my top three podcasts of this year because every single one of them is basically a pop culture podcast. However, they all offer different things and bring different things to the table, depending on what you're going to these podcasts to look for. And number three for my uh, top favorite, or my favorite podcasts of, of this year is The Friendship Onion, hosted by Billy Boyd and Dominic Monaghan, probably best known for playing Merry and Pippin from Lord of the Rings. Uh, but they've been friends for years since they first, uh, you know, starred in that Peter Jackson film. Since they first met just, in the Shire. Exactly. Literally. Since they, they first began their friendship in the Shire. But it's just a really fun and laid back show. There is, of course, a lot of talk of Lord of the Rings because, I mean, that's one of the things that they share between the two of them. But the really cool aspect about that is that they get to have guests onto the show like Sean Astin, like Elijah Wood. They ha they've had Richard Taylor, head of Weta, uh, the a special effects studio that worked on Lord of the Rings. They've had Stephen Colbert, ultra super Tolkien fan, you right. know? And But it's not all just about Lord of the Rings. They've had other guests as well, and they just kind of shoot the shit and talk with each other and talk about their life experiences, both uh, personal and in Hollywood. Uh, and it's just a lot of fun. The Look, I'm an American. I don't really have an accent. Other people in the world probably would say that I have some type of accent. But also just listening to their accents is also a lot of fun. And the banter between the two of them is great. But one of the things that I really like about the show is that at the very end, they have this segment called uh, Billy and Dom Eat the World, in which they have their guest uh, choose a food from their part of the world to share with the two of them. And then they kind of uh, talk about the food and rank it through a whole bunch of different categories. So it's fun to see them uh, eat these different foods from from around the world, wherever their their special guest is from. But I highly recommend the Friendship Onion. It's just a, a fun, like I said, laid back podcast. Something you can toss on in the background. And if you're a fan of both of these people, uh, why aren't you already watching it, right, or listening to it? Have either of you listened at all to the Friendship Onion, or were you able to catch anything from it? No, but I do know the description, which is the Hangout Pod, which I typically, which is like classic Joe Rogan podcast yeah. format, which I think is, which is where that, that lies. I think our podcast admittedly uh, <laughs> borders on Hangout Podcast. It like teeters on the edge of it. <laughs> there's um, some structure here. There's some structure. Um, yeah, every every good thing has structure. I, I, I find myself drifting from from hangout pod to hangout pod i rarely listen to two at the same time because they end up being these big fillers of time when you just want right. to put on something that's gonna make you feel like you're hanging out with friends that are more rich and famous and talented than you uh i find mine right now if i'm gonna shout one out is the jeselnik offensive which is anthony jeselnik and a couple of his friends from like um from college and that they're also like contributors on um i think fox news sports or something and uh it just that's that's my hangout pod but i know exactly the type of podcast you're talking about where it's just like i'm enjoying the company of these people right uh, it kind of feels like they're in the same room i'm also working at the same time i really enjoy just listening to them talk and and, and uh, what's his name uh, monahan danny monahan what's dominic monahan yeah. dominic Dom monahan's like maybe one time that i was on lost yeah yeah that exactly. was weird <laughs> i feel like my character was a bit underdeveloped <laughs> not not exactly his accent but close enough <laughs> yeah he's australian right he's not actually in new zealand oh i think he's uh, he's like british Maybe he's Irish. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna, Dominic uh, Monaghan sounds Monahan. Irish. He might be Irish, yeah. I'm going to oh. get crucified. All right, my name's exactly Dominic, Dominic, Monahan's from. Dominic Monahan. I'm, I'm Irish, I am. The onion but heads are going to come I, after he's you, definitely Chris. Not, uh, he's definitely not Australian or uh, from New Zealand. So. Remember the time that we put hair on our feet? Yep, that sounds like him. Dead on, dead on impression. Is Dominic Monahan on the podcast now for our audio listeners? I was in Lost, you know. I think that was the transporter, actually. <laughs> uh, wasn't Jason Statham. <laughs> Got some goods, and I'm going to transport them. That is more of a Jason Statham. Yeah. So that was my number three, The Friendship Onion. I highly recommend go checking it out, either on YouTube or your podcast player of choice. At number two... It's got layers. It does have layers. It does, just like an onion. <laughs> uh, at number two, my, my second favorite or best podcast of the year is Inside of You with uh, Michael Rosenbaum. <laughs> 
probably best known for playing Lex Luthor on Smallville. Uh, I personally grew up with his voice. He voiced the Flash in uh, Justice League, but uh, he is very well connected, knows a ton of famous people. Uh, so again, similar to Dom <laughs> this and is Billy, the song from Forgetting Sarah Marshall by um, Russell Brand's character. <laughs> you there, there is, inside I of think you. There, there yeah. is a song inside of you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Please continue. Definitely. Chris. But very similar to the friendship onion. He just has his famous friends on and he talks to them. However, what this podcast offers differently than the friendship onion is that Michael Rosenbaum is very good at getting to the core of what makes people tick and kind of the uh, emotional and psychological trials that these actors have gone through, you know? So uh, he himself has suffered from anxiety and depression uh, and he openly admits that and can openly have these conversations with other actors about you know what they're going to therapy for or maybe the vices that they've struggled with and stuff so it's really just not um a a a surface level type of podcast where they're just talking about pop culture he knows these people in an intimate way and he's very good at getting them to uh speak openly and share uh these intimate things about themselves so i really do appreciate that getting to hear (laughs) these very famous people uh talk about their problems And, and i think in a year like 2020 and 2021, that's something important to hear, you know, that everybody has their problems and everybody uh, experiences them in different ways and uh, overcomes them in different ways. So it's a great podcast to listen to just to remind yourself that you're like not alone in whatever you're you're experiencing right now in life. Not me, Chris, Um, not a problem to be found over here on this side of the aisle. Not a single problem at all (laughs) from any of us. We're all (laughs) completely stable. Does he start every podcast and go, all right, let's begin. Now, I'm going to get inside of you. He doesn't, but I I recommend you go watch the openings for the episode because it's something kind of similar. (laughs) Uh, Have either of you seen or listened to Inside of You from Michael Rosenbaum? I have not. Uh, Is is there any particular episode? Because it sounded like with the last one and this one, you can kind of pick any. You don't have to go in any, any certain order. It's more about who they're having on, right? Yes. Yeah. It's it's really just like chew, it, it, pick your poison. You know, like what actors are you familiar with? What actors do you want to hear talk for an hour, hour and a half? Uh, and I would just dive in there. A couple of months ago, I uh, he interviewed Ming Na Wen, and she talked a little bit about her early career in acting and how much of a fan she is of Star Wars and and some other stuff and kind of the uh, challenges she went through as an you know as an Asian actress in Hollywood in you know late eighties, early nineties. Was there an episode uh, titled Anthrax? Not to my knowledge. Why? Well, you said pick your poison. Oh, pick your poison. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think Benny. Cumber- oh, there we I go. Think Where's Benny- that harmonica? I think Benny Cumberbuns was on that episode. Anyway. Uh, Spoilers. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, hey! It's just an inside joke. So if it's if you keep it inside, Brian, then you, then it does. It's not a spoiler. Then it's like, oh, he said that shit when they see it. Sorry. Now, yeah. I've, <laughs> now I've it's made a spoiler. It now it's definitely a spoiler. We won't even say to what. Doctor Strange? Love? Yep. Maybe. Mm-hmm. So that sure. is number two. That is Inside of You. With Michael Rosenbaum. Uh, and at number one is a podcast that I spoke about fairly recently. But during my move, this is probably my most listened to podcast. Uh, and considering that this particular person uh, left or went off the air this year, this is a great way to continue listening to him talk and in what i personally think is a better format a more long form format and that is conan o'brien needs a friend uh it's just so much fun to listen to him talk to again talk to celebrities talk to his famous rich friends you know but um considering how funny he was on air over the last 28 years it's even better in this like long form hour long format because he gets to talk to these people for much longer. He doesn't have the studio giving him notes in terms of like what he's allowed to talk to them about or how long those segments have to be. And I just find myself really looking forward to Mondays where he talks to celebrities and then Thursdays where uh, he airs Conan Needs a Fan in which he talks to just average people. Uh, and it's just a blast. I know you guys have listened to this podcast and we've talked about it a little bit. But if you haven't listened to Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend and you're looking to get into one new podcast this year, this is the one that I recommend. Absolutely. 
Yeah, this has quickly skyrocketed to one of my favorite podcasts after you reminded me about it when you reviewed it recently, Chris. And yeah, I'm definitely, uh, I think at this point, more consistently listening to the Monday episodes with the celebrities. Um, they are just consistently incredible. Conan, when he's talking to guests, it's a little more serious at times. And he, he's playing a different game because yeah. the, the person is not known. But to your point about him utilizing the format entirely just hearing him go on these riffs and taking insane stories to their <laughs> ridiculous conclusions and riffing off of people like someone like howie mandel was someone i'm not particularly a huge fan of or have followed his career that episode was so interesting it was absolutely hilarious and in, informative into howie mandel uh you know as a person but um both just, of will, just a quick a, tangent a about that howie mandel past episode. couple of years for howie mandel oh my god i can't even imagine i i i consider myself oh. to have ocd uh and there are particular ticks that will like set me off and there are things that i have to do but like after listening to the howie mandel episode i was like i'm, I'm okay i'm fine <laughs> i'm fine <laughs> yeah i just feel so bad for that man uh, especially hearing him say like, oh, I, I live in a nightmare. Like my day to day is just a nightmare. It's a nightmare for me. It's it's just, uh, it was hard to listen to, but really interesting for someone who, you know, suffers from similar things, I guess. Well, it just and goes he's to hilarious show. On top and he is hilarious, yeah. <laughs> goes to show when you self-diagnose yourself and then meet, you know, are introduced to someone with the actual disorder. You're like, oh, that's what that actually oh, yeah. looks like. I might yeah, just yeah, have yeah. some tendencies right. <laughs> with, with that. Uh, yeah, I actually find myself gravitating more towards the uh, Conan Needs a, a Fan, and I, I do want to point listeners, uh, I've said this before, but Jim, Jimmy Waldron, who's a friend and co-worker of mine, he he was on the uh, Conan Needs a Friend episode, uh, the, the paleontology one, and that's one that I recommend, but I find it more interesting because uh, they typically do a really great job of getting like a professional in a certain environment, and so wow, Conan's able to bounce off like... Cla he plays the classic like here are all the dumb questions that someone would ask you that we would want to yeah. know but he asked them in such a comical way and the way he finds that balance is just so interesting so i find myself liking those episodes even more so uh than the celebrity ones the celebrity ones are very good and i like those but i find myself really liking the, the Conan needs a fan ones a lot i find a lot of enjoyment out of those he had um he had like a, a mortician on there one time or he was like a he was like a surgeon, a couple like of weeks ER ago. surgeon. Mm -hmm. That was that was really interesting. So, yeah, great recommend, great one for the number one podcast. Conan O'Brien needs a friend, and I especially like it because it doesn't at all compete with what we do, Chris. No, not at all. There's no way we could ever <laughs> compete uh, with Conan O'Brien needs yeah. a friend. I don't even know. It makes me listening to the Conan needs a fan episodes make me think like there's nothing I could come on that would make me like an interesting person in any one area like <laughs> makes me feel like a complete loser uh but it's totally ridiculous and yeah you know i definitely it, think <laughs> uh, you could get through the vetting i think you could i think in fact i think you should try 2022 should be the year that you try to make your way through the vetting process for a conan o'brien needs a fan i told jimmy this because when he was on it i was like you were amazing and what it reminded me of is how bad i would be on it because i'm I am such a huge Conan O'Brien fan. I mean, I watched uh -huh. his late night all the time when I was young. I mean, he was, I, I think you got me into it growing up for sure. I consider myself, a, I have a sense of humor because of him. And there's a lot uh -huh. of like, don't ever meet your heroes. Uh, and I would not know what to do. I, I wouldn't, I don't know. It'd be bad. It'd be You'd just really kind of bad. like lock up. You wouldn't be able to talk at all. <laughs> I would be like, I'm actually just going to cry. I, I would just cry. Like, it would be bad. Um, I consider myself not a very nervous Nelly. Uh, well, I mean, you can tell that a lot of the, the fans that he does dis, uh, have a conversation with, they kind of start off that way, mm -hmm. where they, they need to get it out of their system. You know, we're like, this is so amazing. Like, I'm so happy to be meeting you guys. Like, thank yeah. you for having me. And then once it's out of their system from that point, it's more, it's more of a conversation between two people. You know, you just have to get it out quickly and then realize, like, the situation that you're in. You yeah, know? the situation I'd be in would be, like, I had to lie about what I'm an expert in. So, so you're an electrician. I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Electrons. Uh, Singer, songwriter, fellow podcast host. An electrician. And an electrician. <laughs> Uh, so that is the top three podcast, also available on YouTube. Uh, that is uh, three, The Friendship Onion, two, Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum, and Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend. Chris, excellent selection there. We're going to take a brief break uh, and then come back and talk, talk about our favorite TV shows of 2021. Very exciting stuff. We'll be right back on...
Ha! Ah!